It's the Spill the Wine Show podcast. Hi, everybody. This is your host, Leroy, the wine guy, Guilford. And this is episode number 15. Coming up very close here on the Spill the Wine Show podcast to our one-year anniversary. About a month or so ago, or I should say coming up. And uh, we're sitting on our lovely veranda of Chapin Family Vineyards. Those who have followed my Spill Wine Country Talk radio show for years, and yeah, now the Spill the Wine Show podcast. No, this is where I've hung my hat for 10 and a half years now. And uh, there's some advantages. You know, we get to sip some yummy uh, Chapin wine. Chris, grab your glass there. You'll see. There we go. Got to always have that glass ring in there. Um, sip some wine while we're, while we're uh, definitely chiming in on what's going to be fun today. So we are here sitting on the lovely veranda with puffy white, very tropical clouds, kind of balmy and warm and uh, windy. You'll hear the flag flapping in the background and a few cars hissing by on the other side of the vineyards as it's uh, getting close to people to head home out of our valley. And uh, we're going to have some fun talking about drinking wine when you're on a cruise, like, you know, on a ship or even a sailing schooner. Yes, Chris Baptiste. He's going to tell us all about how you can have some incredible fun (laughs) on, uh, yeah, wine cruises. But I want to remind you also that this uh, podcast is brought to you in part by Monarch Studios. You can find them at monarchstudios.productions. Yeah, they got a dot for everything these days. And Roland over there, he's my engineer producer. And if you want a podcast that gets found everywhere, all you have to do right now is say, Google, give me the Spill the Wine Show, and I am pop up on all the different platforms. And anyways, if you want that same kind of uh, success option, you want to give Roland a holler at there at uh, Monarch Studios Productions. All right, so let's dive in. We're going to talk about going on a wine cruise. Now, if you've never been on a cruise in the first place, they're incredibly fun, lavish, but... A wine cruise has another whole tryst because, yeah, when you go on a cruise, uh, yeah, the bars and the drink packages, they'll have wine. But when you go on a wine cruise, there's very, very special wine. Chris Baptiste, welcome. Chime in here on the Spill the Wine Show podcast. Good afternoon, my friend. How are you? Good. So let's talk about your company. Let's, uh, let's, let's back up a little bit because Chris and I have known each other. He's been involved in our Temecula Valley for a lot of years. Since, and, uh, uh, yeah, 2010. Yeah, so and, and we bumped into various places and the different wineries where you operated and so on. But mm-hmm. little by little, you became this guy associated with Blue Ribbon Cruises and what's the other word? With the, uh, well, Blue Ribbon the, Cruise and Travel. Travel. Yeah, there exactly. we go, Blue Ribbon Cruise and Travel, which totally makes sense. And now that's like you're just uh, a traveling man like the old Rick Nelson song, huh? So. Traveling man? <laughs> no, absolutely, yes. Uh, it, it, you know, I mean, uh, well, A, thank you for having me on. I absolutely. really appreciate it. really appreciate it. And, and yes, um, there's a lot to talk about, a lot to unwrap with that question. But the easy answer is I don't know if there's a, a better experience when you wrap your, your love for wine, right, right, uh, friendship, um, your your thirst for amazing food and experiences, and you wrap that together with a bunch of like people, like minded people, and and you take them somewhere in the world, and and celebrate it, and that's essentially what we do. And uh, uh, now I have to admit, there's been four. Well, let's see, one, two, three cruises, and a fourth one coming up with Chapin Family Vineyards that you put together. And somehow I've not had the stars align for all three of those cruises. But the next one, we'll get which will go to, you're going to Italy and Greece. But we'll talk about that in a yeah. few moments. Mm-hmm. I got to definitely make sure I'm in the queue on that one. Absolutely. So, so let's talk a little bit. So how how did the journey pouncing around a wine club? bring you to the point where you got involved with this and then of course we'll dive in and talk about the wine cruises yeah uh, you know like i said 2010 is when i started down here in temecula um it's a long long story how i got here um but essentially lived in los angeles for the Mm -hmm. previous 13 years and worked in the music industry Mm. so not too far away from your your world in in the in the radio world right okay so let's 
peel a little bit of that onion because <laughs> this is something I didn't know well, in all the go. years we've known yeah, each other. So what yeah. what 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 area of the wine of the music industry were you involved in? A and R mostly. Oh, okay, um, awesome. Yeah, so got my start with Virgin Records way awesome. back in the day in like the wow. mid nineties, yes. and then a, a, a brief spell with Warner Chapel Music, and then I got my real first, I guess you could say, taste of it and real start with ASCAP. American yes, Society of okay. Composers, mm-hmm. Authors, and Publishers, mm-hmm. and uh, got a lot of tutelage there before I moved on to a company, an independent company called Taxi, and essentially it's a, uh, or what, I think it's still, I think it's still happening, it's a company for songwriters and artists right. to go ahead and join, it's like a membership, and and we with an a and staff, amongst myself and a bunch of other people that are way more talented than I will ever be, we help them get their music to the industry. Whether, That's awesome. Whether it's yeah. to TV shows like Grey's right. Anatomy back in the day. So or, the writers who are busy behind the scenes. Yeah. I, I got to yeah. chime in and say, yeah, did you hear a, a, a saw going in the background? We are at oh, a yeah. live working winery right now, and the field guys are out there doing some constructing on stuff that Mr. Chapin has them busy at. So we just move on through it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. As people are like, what was that noise? Yeah, that was definitely a buzzsaw you just heard there a second ago. So so that's very fascinating. That's an area I love, the music industry. As many know, I've collected music since I was 10 years old. And yeah. My kids are like, Dad, what do you want to do when you kick the bucket? Because I have a bazillion, well, maybe not that many, but I still have a lot of vinyl LPs. Sure. Around a thousand, but about 5,000 CDs all organized oh, yeah. and categorized. And, you know, they're like, who cares? Yeah. I can just pull it up on my phone. No, it's not yeah. the same thing. Hey, it's not the same. Well, yeah, we can talk about this forever. Yeah, huh? so, yeah. All right. So you ended up here from there. How'd that happen here in Temecula Valley? Yeah, you know, I think... Overall, I got tired of Los Angeles. Yes. I'll be honest with you. I was born in L.A. I can identify. I felt like I did my time mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. And I felt like even though I was moving on from a pretty pretty, um, pretty successful career, I think, what I'd built at that point, I needed something different. And I didn't know what it was. I'll be right. honest with you. Mm-hmm. I took some time off after leaving uh, the company taxi. You know, I, I, I left that on on my own accord, and, and I just, I was searching a little bit. I'll make a longer story, a little shorter, <laughs> in so much that it's the same time that my parents, after 40 years, decided to split. Uh-huh. So, quick cut to both of them in Northern California. My mom decides to move to Southern California to be closer to my sister with the grandkids. She ends up here in Temecula, well, in Menifee. In Menifee. In Menifee. Very, pretty close. You know, we throw in, rock to it. In Menifee. So, yes, yes. And it was at the perfect time where she said, you know what? If you want to start over, come with me. Awesome. And that's what I did. So after all that, yes, I moved in with my mom. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and you're not even a millennial. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, I've gotten past all that. Yeah, exactly. And Uh-oh. Not, not to make my millennial listeners mad. Okay. No, no, no. Uh, and and it was a, it was a fantastic uh, kind of re. Well, I don't know. It, it, it worked out well. Right. It worked out well, and and that was late two thousand nine. So no, but what's the connection to the wine industry? Were you a wine lover already? No. Aha. Uh-huh. So down here in two thousand nine, I know nobody. Right. Yes. There is no industry down here except. Wine. wine, yes. So I put two and two together really quickly. I'm like, well, I better get some resumes out. Now, per my experience with the wine industry, it was very uh, service, uh, customer service oriented. Right. So mm-hmm. uh, the, working with people, talking with people, et cetera, that's never been a uh, something that's difficult for me, I guess you could say. And I do remember this distinctly. I put out 13 resumes and only one winery called me, and that was Wayne's family uh, winery down here, right. family yeah. cellars. And that's where I got my start. What I've learned through the years, uh, th- through other winemakers, but everything kind of started with the Wayne's family. Awesome. And and what they, I mean, they were a fantastic company to work with right. and work for. Mm-hmm. 
and some fantastic memories. And that's where I kind of, you know, quote unquote, cut my teeth with wine and learned so much in a short you know, period of time. Always enjoyed wine, but was never someone who felt like it was a, a passion or, right. or, or something that I wanted to get into, right? It was a bottle to find to, for a date, right? Yeah. And, you know, you got to figure out what, what bottle of wine to, you know, that your date might like or something like so that. So this was more just a job opportunity, but it opened a big, giant door. So yes. Yes. that's it. That's and, it. And, I, and then I fell into it, and I loved it. Yes. I loved it. Now, you know? I, can, I can validate folks that he is definitely a wine drinker because he drinks lots of cheap and wine. I see him here oh, quite yeah. often. <laughs> no, that's easy. Yes. Matter of fact, you put together the three cruises that Chape and Family Vineyards has yep. done over the last five years, Correct. Yes. right? Yep. Yeah, and the most recent one was up the Duro River yep. Portugal. Uh, in Portugal mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. back in November, for which this is going to set the stage because I've twisted Mr. Chapin's arm and said, you have to say, Uncle... It means you're going to be on my podcast and talk about the trip up the Duro River, and he's agreed. So yeah, I thought this good. would be the great prelude to that. Okay. Well, he's yeah. I mean, just a, a quick note on that. I know we'll get to it a little bit later, but yeah. I think of the three that we've done so far, and we've been mm-hmm. on the Rhine River, so mostly Germany, right. you know, France, uh, and then um, the Danube River, right. so mostly Austria. And, and then this last one, he, he that was his favorite. It was. Portugal yeah, was his did, favorite. He did lots of studying on the oh, history of the area. Yeah. He's kind of a renaissance man anyways. He's he an is. incessant reader. And, of course, mm-hmm. he's uh, he's a microbiologist out of the medical field, and he's the winemaker, and he's quite at home in his you know, lab out here being mad scientist, yeah. you know. And uh, so he, he, when it comes to something that he has – to present to somebody else, he wants to know every single little nuance that could be presented. He and I have always gotten along well because I'm kind of like that as you well. You both have a, a huge history buff vibe to yes. you, both of you, absolutely. Um, and we could tell, I could tell all kinds of stories, but one, and I know we kind of got away from what we were talking about a little bit, but on our his very first cruise, uh, so that was 2018 on the Rhine River, right. so from mm-hmm. Amsterdam down to Switzerland. Uh, he did a lot of research on that, you know, that area, the, right. the Rhine mm-hmm. Gorge, the grapes. Obviously, they're mm-hmm. they're grown there, and then found out that uh, our Thomas Jefferson also cruised the Rhine, in, I believe the late 18th century. Correct. So late, yeah. Yeah. And so what Steve did is retraced his entire trip the best he could, and then presented that on our ship in one of his lectures. So he was just so in tune. It wasn't just a matter of where we are, right? The terroir that we're in Germany, that you know, all that stuff. It, no, he was able to bring something very American uh, to his to to our trip in Europe. You know, there was there was a, a fantastic connection. One of his favorite books, and uh, one that I've only uh, dabbled in because it's pretty big, but. People don't know it, but Thomas Jefferson wrote quite a little to me called Thomas Jefferson on Wine. Yeah. And of course, yeah. those who don't know this part of our American history, but uh, he was the first in the White House, which was very early on, as you all know, our little chain of the founding fathers, yep. uh, to create a wine library there at the White House. So he, he spent a lot of time in his own life living in France, mm-hmm. you know, because he was a diplomat for the Americas uh, when they were in the midst of the Revolutionary War over in France. So yeah. that's another whole story. We it could is. go on yeah. forever. So let's talk about Blue Ribbon. How yeah. did you come uh, so, to be yeah. associated with these folks? So uh, I, I have spent some time at a couple different wineries down here. Uh, I started off, you know, serving wine just like everyone else, but then fairly quickly got to management for good or bad uh, <laughs> and moved on to a couple of different wineries like Cougar right mm-hmm. and then Lorenzi yes and then uh, eventually ended up at Europa Village you know down the way a uh, really popular winery and was their wine club manager and and in that time we as a winery started doing cruises with Blue Ribbon Cruise and Travel uh-huh so I, being the wine club manager, became the liaison between, uh, who is my boss and kind of my mentor, uh, Per Nilsson from Blue Ribbon, co-owner, mm-hmm. and the winery. 
So I was his contact person, whether it was uh, distributing flyers or putting together a cruise night to go ahead and, and talk to our wine club members about the cruises. All of it was involved. Instead of him going to a to our general manager or such, I was the person. I was the point person. So he and I became like close, like quick friends. One thing led to another. Led like to another. And, and after, song. yeah, and One then after a couple years, he presented me with an opportunity to get in at a very, very, I mean, there's no money in it <laughs> immediately, right? You have to build right. a base, right? right? You have to build a yes. client base. But, but that's it, kind of like the wine industry in general. Yeah. The, those and, that see it from the outside and all the sparkle and sizzle. And the fun and the romance. Wait until you work at the winery. Yeah. And you know, and it's funny. Now that I think about you know, it, it yeah. I, maybe I've always been a person that has to do something different every so often. Every yeah. You know. For, you know well, um, I identify with that for sure. Yeah. Yes. I mean, you know, yeah. my father worked for the uh, same company for 40 plus years. You know, retired and he's happy. Right? Mm-hmm. But that was never, ever, ever me. So... I think very similar to how I moved on from the music industry in Los Angeles, Mm -hmm. I think I was getting done with the whole wine industry as far as the wineries. Yes. That perspective. Now, I'd see now here, in my case, I have been here, you know, basically as a wine server these days. But I was the manager like you. I remember. I remember those years. Yeah, I remember that. I take life a little easier. But I've always had these outside outlets. Wine Country Talk Radio. I ran Shop Temecula Wines that sold all the wines of our Temecula Valley. So like you, I always had to be on... I had to find something that put me on the cutting edge, you know, that was fun. Yeah. And right now, you seem to really be... On the cutting edge, because now how many wineries are doing cruises in our valley? Oh, well, gosh, um, I would say probably pretty close to eight or so, maybe. But but that there's more than that that's been involved. So right. mm-hmm. I, will, I will have to say the last couple of years with uh, the pandemic right. has really altered everything with travel. Right. right. And that, that's a no brainer. Everyone yes. knows that. Yep. Um, but where we were starting, uh, where I was kind of coming from doing starting this in 2000, uh, 2017, essentially, um, 2020 was going to be a good year for me. <laughs> <laughs> I had uh, various groups. I had various uh, I had all kinds of things going lined up and every, obviously everything was canceled. Right. I you know I have to chime in because yeah. I for a brief spell, we had about a four month stretch where. After my little time out from Chapin for some life issues, um, I came back in in late 2019, early 2020, and I was doing our outside commercial sales. It was kind of an experiment for the first time. We got it about nine different little Southern California, you know, family-oriented restaurants, and it was like running like a rocket, and wham, like so many of us experienced, it all just went kapoof. So we had Gone. to... We yeah. had to be patient, and we yeah. had to scramble a little bit, too. Yeah, yeah and then so, and speaking yeah. on your side, yeah, yep. I mean, wineries closed, of course. Yep. Um, you know, people lost their jobs. Uh, people, I mean, it was everything. Everything that everyone experienced. But think about the, the two sectors, right? Uh, wine hospitality and, and travel. The, <laughs> the things that are extras, in yes. a way, yeah. right? They're, they're not our food, and they're not our water, Some people argue that, you know, with the wine, but, you know, all of that just kind of came to a screeching halt. And if you were in the music industry at that time, you talked to anybody there, everything. Everything did. All the people that were playing live. Productions, uh, touring. You know, recording music during that time from different studios conjoined together via internet and digital works and so on. It was an interesting time. I have have a lot of friends that are still in uh, film and TV Uh production. And yeah, their world's just just dried up just like everyone else. And it was... um, yeah, it was, it, it was a challenging time. Right. It was a challenging well, it time. caused some of us to be a little more creative, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Now, I have to say, I, I got real creative because um, I took time out uh, because I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay in a, in, in a retired fashion. Mm-hmm. And my lovely wife and I took a trailer and took five weeks and cruised the whole United States and stopped at wineries that, yes, even though COVID was going on in a lot of other states, it wasn't such a big deal. Not everyone and, had uh, the same rules as yes, California. So we, we, we were able to stop at a number of different wineries in different states and, and, and enjoy ourselves, yeah. you know. So, yeah. yeah. 
No, absolutely. So then just the, the, the quick transition there, that's how I got started with Blue Ribbon, but mm-hmm. before it could really get going, for me personally. Right. Now, this is a, a very, company itself is like small and mighty. It's just two people, husband right. and wife, plus a couple other people, employees, and then added me on. So it's not lean like this. Lean and mean. Super yes. lean and mean. Yeah. Quite successful. And just like everything else, uh, COVID just kind of just snapped everything up. So right. it didn't matter how successful you are, right. you know. So just for example, them, they went from having this fantastic, beautiful house in, in wine country out here where the office was mm-hmm. to having to make a decision of having to move to, to Florida last year because of everything, you know, and re- kind of, not not restarting, but kind of just um, just so the, the bleeding wasn't as bad, I guess right. you could say. Right, right, right. So, but that's kind of the neat thing about some of the digital things of the day in that uh, a lot of communication and back and forth um, can be handled. All of these now online. I just went through a thing where I had to do notarization. Didn't have to leave my – just electronically sign everything online and so on. So, I mean, we live in a time where, you know, uh, digital – Commuterism, if I can make up a word, yeah, um, is, is quite normal. You know? Absolutely. So, yeah. Well, I mean, I work from home myself anyway, have been for years anyway, mm-hmm. but then now it's it's quite normal, right? And there's I still have a lot of friends, and we all do, uh, people we know, that maybe their companies are requesting them back in the office, but maybe they're not. Maybe they've discovered something else. So I'm going to ask you, know? you to grab your glass here, because yes, we are in a warm, toasty afternoon, and our crispy, cold Viognier here is... Um, well, don't you love that sound? Is uh, starting to warm up, so we got to we got to keep it going where it's supposed to go. Absolutely. Mm. And so, just a reminder: you listen to the Spill the Wine Show podcast with your host, Leroy Wine Guy Guilford, and we're out here on the lovely veranda at uh, Chapin Family Vineyards in Southern California, just Temecula Wine Country, which was voted very recently in the last couple of years by one of the big magazines, yeah, Spectator, that uh, we are among the 10 favorite spots in the world to visit on the way of wine countries. So that's um, that was quite an accomplishment at our 50-year mark, which we just celebrated 54 years in May of us becoming a wine grape farming community. Audrey and Vinny Slurzo, I always love to mention them. They were the matriarch, patriarch, roll the dice they they said let's let's plant the grapes. We have no idea we're going to sell them, and we don't have enough money to build a winery. But if we start it, who knows? And here we are, all these years later, with about fifty three wineries now. So, all right. So, let's talk about the cruises specific. Now, yep. there's a lot of them. Yep. So I want to tease people. So if they're uh, let's talk about the different kinds of places that you've gone. Maybe some of the stories out of those. Okay. And what are some of the things uh, coming up? I mean, at any of the number of different wineries, they've got different destinations and time frames. If you know some of those at this point, just in a rough sketch, because I know if I'm going, let's see, if I'm going to go, I've got this window of time, you know, in such and such month. So uh, maybe we could tickle the ears and pull the fancy on yeah. some of the folks here. Okay. Uh, so in that regard, let's start off with Chapin. Yes. You know, Chapin Family Vineyard. It's no mistake that we're both here. We, we, we both love this place. Yes. This is our fourth cruise with Mr. Chapin and his family, and we're going to do a really kind of unique yacht-style cruise. I'm looking at the picture on the brochure, and um, this is a four-mast schooner that you're going to sail around the uh, Mediterranean, Mediterranean, yeah, uh, and uh, a little bit in between, um, in between Sicily and Greece. There, what is that? The Adriatic, Adriatic Sea, yeah, Adriatic yeah, Sea, so. yeah, the Ionian wow. Sea. We're going to hit yeah. all that. So, uh-huh. so it is. It's a Rome to Athens uh, itinerary, which is you know very common in the cruise world. But this is this is going to be unique because. Uh, and I'm uh, of the uh, of the same mind that Steve Chapin is. Mm-hmm. He doesn't like the big ships, right? So let's let's get that out of the way here already. But we're talking about wine cruising. Uh, uh, myself and the company that I work with, we're not into that. So the whole like twenty five hundred, three thousand people on a ship and all that, that's not our vibe. We we do mostly uh, river cruises, mm-hmm. European river cruises, and then smaller ocean ships. Right. So if we had our way, they'd be about maybe eh, 500 guests max or less. 
that's that's the kind of thing we're looking at. We're looking at more luxury uh, style cruising than just going out for a three day Caribbean cruise. That's yes. not our not yeah, our that's thing. Not, you know, it's a different world. Not our thing. Yes, so right. so with this, this is Windstar Cruises, and they have a fantastic fleet of ships. And this one, the Star, but it, it's a, it's not a. A oh, large a ship cruise. in the sense of yeah. how many people are going to be on board, right? So at the very you know, max, 150 guests. Yeah, so you can even get to know 150 people, you know, when you're hanging out on a couple. And that's the neat thing. You make so many new friends. Absolutely. From literally all over the world. Absolutely. So so in our goal, my goal is always to have a nice, hearty group, right, that represents the winery, mm-hmm. that represents Steve and his wine quite well. That makes his family happy, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, all of the above. And and I think that we're probably going to have at least over 60 guests in our group. So we'll probably have half the ship that's just the Chapin Family Vineyard Wine Group. Well, that- let's see. It shows here. So starting on April 29th, this is a year out, folks. Well, a little less than a year now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Rome and then Ponza, Sorrento, Messina, and then you spend a day, one day, all day at sea. And then Githian and... Monavis, if I say it right, Monavisea. I, I know I messed that up. That's pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> and Athens. That would be, they talk about history and drink. Now, you know, there's a little war between the Greeks and the uh, Italians because sure. we serve it up here at Chapin, that yummy Alianico. Mm-hmm. And uh, the Italians now, for two millennia plus, call it their grape, but it originated in Greece, and it was the Romans that absconded with it. And so, yeah, yeah, it'd be interesting to taste some Greek Alianico maybe on that trip. And so, let's talk about itinerary, typical, not just this trip, but the ones in general. Mm-hmm. I mean, people are not just, it's not... It's hard to describe it, but the camaraderie you see from the pictures and everything else. I mean, Mr. Chapin every time and, and the other winemakers in the valley will usually feature their wines throughout yeah. the uh, days on the boat when you're dining and having a great time. And so talk a little bit about how that's all put together. Sure. So every cruise line has, uh, I guess, a different model. But mm-hmm. I'll take the, the Alma Waterways Cruises uh, model that we've... We, that's probably the cruise line I know best. And the last three cruises with the Chapin uh, Winery, we've been on Alma Waterways. And they have a fantastic wine host program where not only do, say, Mr. Chapin as the owner or the winemaker, whoever right. is the representative mm-hmm. of that particular mm-hmm. winery, uh, they'll be the wine host for the entire ship. So it's not just our group that they're, you know, that they're representing, I guess you could say. Um, if we're doing a wine hosted cruise, then they are representing Alma Waterways. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that's where we get to go ahead and ship maybe 18 cases of his wine over. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, by the way, just for a tease, folks, when they went up the Dural River, he's talking about fact. Here. Yeah, yes, okay. yes. They said a half a pallet of wine to be <laughs> right. consumed <laughs> so, and, while, while cruising. You know. Absolutely, yes. because it's, it's a fun um, experience to not only delve into the wine history that we're, where we are. Right. right. So say, for example, in Portugal that we were just in and all the fantastic wines, especially red wines, because they do so much more than just port, you know, there. Um, but to then go ahead and drink local vintages and then taste and compare to what Steve does here in California, right. Southern California mm-hmm. specifically. That's fun. That's well, fun. And, and then you come back with a stash of uh, overseas Wines and what have some you. Do. Mr. Chapin brought back uh, some very interesting yeah, things. You some know. do. Absolutely. And, and he was able to get uh, long standing, I mean, ancient winemaking operations because these folks in, in Europe, you know, they'll be generation after generation after generation. Oh, absolutely. Literally, yeah. they're still running the same place with a lot of the same techniques and so on. And uh, they were tasting his Syrah particularly and flipping out over it. <laughs> he had a really <laughs> good response cool. with yes. people on the ship oh. as far mm-hmm. as the, the staff, right? Mm-hmm. And, and and people with Alma Waterways who obviously have done this a lot. That's obviously what mm-hmm. they do. Not every winery is built the same. Right. You know, we're smiling at each other. We know what we're talking about. But uh, the, Chapin's brand is, is one of the best here in Temecula. You know, oh, they, we appreciate they, that. They, they yeah. just, you know, well, you, so, he's, yeah. you guys do fantastic. Well, fact is fact. Yeah, know, but, so, well, yes, I mean, that's, yeah, yeah I, I don't lie. So, so, what, <laughs> so let's talk about when people uh, 
you know, at the various ports, yeah. deep part, what's a typical day like? When yeah, you head so out? again, it depends on the cruise line, but if we're going to do a river cruise, then mm-hmm. every day is pretty packed with uh, different tours and excursions that you can take, all complimentary, all right. part of the package. Oh, all part the, of the package. Now, that's package. an important part, yes. You uh-huh. know, so, you, so mm-hmm. there's nothing extra that you're paying for in that right. regard, and you don't have to sign up for something and be logged into it. If you want to go ahead and say, wake up that morning, and instead of going to uh, this particular winery on a particular uh tour and maybe just want to be on the ship that day and be in the pool and 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 relax that way or maybe you want to do something separate port tasting you know that type of thing you have no restrictions in that that regard so every but every day is busy you know Mm -hmm. you're getting up there's coffee. There's breakfast, of course. Yes. Um, and then excursions and tours start around 9 a.m. for the morning tours. Back right. back around lunch, uh-huh. right? If there's some afternoon uh, tours, fantastic. If not, then there's other stuff going on. Uh, it always leads back to a cocktail hour. Imagine that. <laughs> and dinner. Yes. And, and, and everything in the lounge afterwards. And I think that's some of the most fun. Yes, right. we have the experiences off the ship. But on the ship is a lot of fun, so too. So the, t- the typical cruise, as far as number of days, would yeah. be one week or Cru- give or take a few days? Yes. So, so, so yeah. seven-day mm-hmm. cruise is generally what we do. Right. Uh, we can do a little longer. Right. But then we also have pre- and post options as well. So say, for example, with the Portugal trip, uh, a lot of our guests in our group did the three-day in Lisbon pre-cruise. Oh, yes. So they came in early, a la Steve, um, came in and, and we just soaked up Lisbon for, for three days and three nights, and then we transferred up to Porto for the ship and then started the cruise. Okay, so now let's talk about the other elements yeah. that go with it, okay? So when somebody's, and, and let's just use ballpark numbers, but if somebody's yeah. interested on in going on a cruise, and each cruise has its different things that add to the variances, but what are typically... The price point uh, and, you know, double occupancy kind of mm-hmm. thing. So people can kind of ballpark in their mind. Yeah, what we do, uh, I think we generally find, and believe me, we price is a big uh, consideration. Absolutely. It really is. It, it, you know, we're, we're not out there doing the most expensive thing, but we're also doing probably some of the best things. So generally with flights, um, I always tell people just plan on 5000 a person. Okay. Mm-hmm. Just as a general. Oh, with the flights included. With the flights included. Well, see, now that's, yeah. It might be a little bit more. Right. You know, it depends right. on, the, on the room that you guys mm-hmm. book. It depends on how much you personally spend on the trip doing other things, of right. course. Mm-hmm. But as far as cruise, flights, the things that we include in the package as well, shipboard credits, gifts, I mean, and, those and kind of things. And I also know, um, you know, of course, the price on fuel for everything right now is affecting yeah. airline uh, price points, but... Um, I know there were a number of folks that booked together to fly out and fly over because they got like a group rate and mm-hmm. some things like that. So there's ways to be crafty if you've got there some is. friends that want to team up and, oh, absolutely. and take a trip. And, right? and, and generally, so we're, mm-hmm. we are a full service travel agency. Right. So we can help in all of those aspects. But we also like to go through, say, the cruise line air departments first to see what they have, Mm -hmm. because sometimes Mm -hmm. they can be really good. Some of them aren't so good, but we know to stay away from them. (laughs) (laughs) So Um, what are some of the places now that have, you know, been trips of the past that people might go, wow, I wish I would have gone there. And what's within the context over this next year with all the different wineries here in our Temecula Valley, Mm -hmm. just off the top of your head, what are some of the places that that uh, our uh, cruises are booked out are yeah. going to be so top of my head, to go to. Yeah. yeah, so Europa Village, they are doing Alma Waterways River Cruise in Europe. They're doing a Paris, um, essentially Paris Normandy. Mm-hmm. And, and what time of the year is That's that That's going to be yet? late July, early August of this year. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, the next cruise we have is going to be a Christmas markets cruise. Wow. Mm. Now, this is under uh, my, uh, the owners of of, wine, of uh, Blue Ribbon also have a wine label. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So Nilsson Family Estates. So we're going under that guise, I guess you could say. But it's it's a family type of Christmas markets on the Rhine River uh, from Lake Como, Italy, all the way up to Amsterdam. So that'll be this December. So, so that's that 
near Christmas time, or you'll be out and about on on Christmas. It's the the fifth of December through the twelfth, so it's right in between. Oh, right in between. Right in go. between Thanksgiving okay. and Christmas. I, I was yeah. just gonna say everybody's probably got it come to mind. Well, if you're old enough, like yeah. The movie Christmas with the Cranks, but <laughs> but right. my my first and late wife Phyllis, she and I in 2007 did exactly that. We got back on Christmas Eve day from a week long cruise in yeah. the Caribbean, and we. Uh, yeah, we didn't put up any decorations, any tree or anything else. We just showed up at the kids' house. You yeah, know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, so yeah, that would be fun. So you can still go and get your Christmas fun in another nation and and, and some history and fun, and be back in time to spend with your families. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and tr- okay. to truly get into what the European spirit of Christmas is all about. Yes, and, and, and they're they're much more traditional. They in that have fashion. they yeah. go all out. Yeah. All okay, out. so what are some of the others? Yeah. So then after that, then we're starting. To Look at it next year, yes, 2023. Mm-hmm. So we mentioned the Chapin Cruise. That's uh, the 29th of April through May 6 of next year. But right before that, Palumbo Family Vineyards down yes. the way. We're going to do the Danube River. So oh. we're going to do Budapest to Germany. So Vilshoven, Germany, mm-hmm. include Prague as well as a post cruise. So. Um, it, it, I've been on the Danube River three times now. It's one of my favorite itineraries. And the, the Austrian uh, wine country is just some of the most spectacular, beautiful area that I've ever seen. I know from the trip uh, several years ago, we have a slide presentation in the tasting room. And the pictures of the just hills and hills and hills of vineyards that go on and on. It's really amazing. It's amazing. Right, it's, it's, right it's, down to the water edge. Yeah. And, and it's so different than what we have here in California, yes. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, everything is, is spread out. Everything's rolling hills, etc. But there along the rivers, everything is steeped and everything is, is like you said, there, there's a, some of them are like almost 90 degree angles. It's amazing. But they've been doing this for centuries. Yes. Centuries. So like, like our trip in Portugal, you know, mm-hmm. everything outside of a of the city Porto going east towards Spain, everything is vineyard. That's all it is out there. There's tiny little towns here and there, mm-hmm. but everything is agriculture. And they've been doing this for over a thousand years. And I, I, I think when that sinks in and you're you're, yes. you're you're there and you're tasting the wine and you're you're enjoying the food and and hearing about the history I don't know. At least for me, that just sinks in and and puts me in a pretty, you know, we're we're small. We're small people. And and our history is small, especially here in the United States, by comparison. Exactly. All the years. Yes. Especially the wine industry. I mean, we're talking about centuries and centuries. You mentioned earlier, how long has Temecula been around for a wine country? 54 (laughs) 54 years. 54 years. It's like a drop in a bucket. It's nothing. They probably, you know, some Or the ocean, maybe. (laughs) Right. Which I have to throw this in there because I... Uh, Mr. Chapin invites me to uh, do some little history of our valley presentations as we do our French Oak Barrel Wine Club. They literally have hands-on in the whole aging process of their own French Oak Barrel wines. And I was talking about some facts about our Temecula Valley in the current aspect. Do you know that Temecula makes less than 1% of all the wine produced in California? Yeah, that makes sense. But we draw over 14% of all the visitors to wineries. To so put that in number aspect, we have about 4,700 wineries functioning in California. Mm, around 4,000 are actually the bona fide bonded. You know, there's people off the beaten paths there that you. And in uh, those, these are 2016 numbers, some 21 million, as the Wine Institute collects this information, uh, across the state visited wineries during that year in 2016. Now, it's amazing. In 2016, nearly 3 million of that 21 million came to our Temecula Valley because we're less than a 90-minute drive for most people here in we're Southern situated California. Quite 22 well. million people, 90 minutes away from us. You yeah. know? So it's pretty amazing that we're such a young area with such, uh, with such well, let's say, success and popularity. Popularity is a good word, you yeah. know. Um, yeah, that, and that's a whole other thing we could talk about, too. But, yeah, by comparison, we're such a young... Uh, and vibrant 
wine country. But when we're which, which then I'm going to I'm going to jump in here on yeah. purpose um, that the vibrant element once again has to do with the fun of all the cruises that has really caught fire. So let's run forward again. What are some of the other cruises we were talking about? Sure. So we're actually working with uh, Fazelli Sellers. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're going to do. We're speaking of the Duro. They're right. going to do a Duro cruise next year uh, in August, I believe it is. That's going to be with my boss, uh, Perry Nelson. We just started a new cruise with Masea de la Vina. Right. Right down mm-hmm. the way. It's yes. going to be their very first cruise. We're talking about the pandemic before we had a cruise with Danzo del Sol in 2020. It went away. But the owner, Bob, Bob Olson, right. mm-hmm. um, he's recently sold Danza, but still owns a Masea, and he wants to go ahead and do a cruise again. So we're going to do one. And it's oh, n- next year, uh-huh. and it's next summertime, and it's, uh, I believe it's um, Rome to Barcelona. Wow. So somebody's listening right now and going, gosh, I want to get in on this. Um, you know, they have to determine which winery is the one that they want to be we hanging out with. But sometimes <laughs> it's a matter of what's the calendar. So sure. we talked about those. Where can people go relative to an itinerary overall, or at least a, 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 a sketch of what are some of the cruises coming up? Can they, does Blue Ribbon yeah. Cruises have, so you have a website where Blue, they could go and see what it is that's uh, on, the, on the upcoming uh, menu, if you will? Absolutely. It's funny you mentioned this. We just updated our website, and we're actually going to really update our website here in, in the in near future but we have all of our group cruises up on blueribboncruise.com super super easy to do yep you hit the first page there's a section there for group cruises click that and you'll see our i think we have about eight different trips up there right now so there you go you can easily if you look at your little future calendar and go wow i could target that and save up the money for that by this point in time now we favor chapin family vineyards of course but uh Sometimes it's just a matter of which one fits in the calendar, and they're all, all done so well. And let's face it, there are a lot of really fun people involved in our wine country here. Um, All of these usually feature the owners or people very involved with the winery uh, going along as the host or hostess. uh, Because they want to tell their tale as well. Yeah, that's the key is... is the representation from the winery. We want that person, whoever it is, because mm-hmm. it's not always the same person. Right. So here at Chapin, obviously, Mr. Chapin is owner and winemaker. Yeah. Okay. But that's not everywhere. Uh, no, no, no. That's at not all. everywhere. So, for example, Europa Village Winery, uh, Doug Garman, who is their uh, lead psalm, lead right. sommelier, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. well, he's their host when he goes, when, when we do cruises with him. You know, so mm-hmm. it's not the general manager, right. it's not the winemaker, it's Doug Garman. For Palumbo, it's Nick and Cindy Palumbo. There you go. Right? Yes. You know, we get both of them for that one. Yeah, yes. Uh, <laughs> right? And, so, and, and just uh, as a plug for them, I've known them. Now, they have their kiddos now working in the tasting room. Uh, they do. And, yeah. and I remember in the early days when Cindy was walking around, with, with the basketball in the belly, <laughs> <laughs> with one one of the kids now that is almost old enough to be one of their servers. So, yeah, yeah the, now, they're, they're, they're a great family story here in our valley as they're well. They're fantastic. So, they're amazing. Uh, this will be our second uh, group cruise with them. And, and you're speaking of kids. She's she's going to have two grandkids by December this year. Oh, how fun. Yeah. Wow. Now so, all we have to do is, and I say we, meaning those of us who love our wine country, is... Uh, entice the next generation to hang around because when you get behind the scenes in this business there's a lot of blood sweat and tears Mm -hmm. there's a lot of reward but uh, anything that has big reward has big labor involved uh, in big labor in the sense of what you're going to be putting into it on your own blood sweat and tears and you know there's uh, there's a number of wineries we've seen so here in the last uh, pa- over this mm-hmm. last ten years, where the kids who were involved with the winery owners decided, I'll take a pass, you know, because it is it is something that requires intense passion, you know. I have a quick story on that one. Oh, go outside of Temecula, but per one of my trips this past November, 
with Palumbo. So we went to the Rhone region of France. Mm -hmm. So along the Rhone River. And one on, on our, I believe, our, our first or second day on the cruise itself, another river cruise, uh, we went up to Beaujolais. And we visited a winery, and I don't remember the winery's name. Right. Mm -hmm. Husband and wife, owner and winemaker, probably in their 70s, I'm guessing. That winery has been owned by the same family for over 600 years. Okay? Their son, who is next in line to right. follow mm -hmm. that, has been the first one in all that time to say, no, thank you. Wow. So instead of, well, I don't know what conversation that was over the dinner table, but, <laughs> um, and I don't, you know, so what's happened? The daughter. Oh, awesome. Is going to take over. Yeah. And at the time we visited last November, she was in Australia with an internship with another winery so she could learn their, their practices right. there mm -hmm. and take all of that back. Even though they pretty much grow only one grape, I think, in that region. Uh, I think two grapes, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and who knows what the future will be, but France is very traditional. Right. Um, but, well, that, but that's a great example of... That well, was, I've always found that that would be for the operations that held that history of generation after generation. There has to be a certain amount of sacrifice on the, the underlings, if you will, yeah. to want to be able to continue the tradition. Sure. Because you know? sometimes you got to trade off what, maybe what you're thinking you'd want to wander off and do versus uh, what you grew up in. You know? The world's a big place. Yeah. And, and if you see your future from, a, from the age of whenever... You know, <laughs> that this is your future. Well, uh, I mean, I've never had that experience, but that would be something you would really embrace, right? Yeah, or yeah. not. <laughs> no, it's, it's no secret, but uh, <clears throat> I'm going to pass into another decade here <laughs> in, a, in a handful of days uh, coming up this weekend, and it'll be the 26th, and I will be celebrating my 70th. Birthday. Now, I haven't given up hopes on leaving, I don't know, maybe not a winery, but a, a, maybe a more historic vineyard um, to, you know, uh, you might say the uh, lineage, kids, grandkids, or whoever, uh, whomever in that amount of time I could get interest. Right now, there doesn't seem to be any takers, but since I don't have a winery anyways, it doesn't, I don't know that it's a problem. <laughs> sure, it'll only take a few million dollars. That's all, you know. There, there's a few places out here I know that will yes. gladly take your money. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Chris, what a great little visit here. This Dang. is so much fun. I want to encourage you folks, you know what, the I, I know I'm remiss myself, but I tell you, it is on the bucket list. And uh, I saw this book I have, and uh, it's about that. I'm holding it up in front of uh, in front of Chris here with my fingers. It's like a thousand pages because it's a thousand and one wines you have to taste before you <laughs> die. And I thought, you know, I better get busy. Now, the thing is, when you flip through the book, half of them are on the other side of the world. And the only way you can taste them is to go there. That so is I, true. I, I, need to get, I need to get busy. But that's that kind of a situation. It takes the passion to dive into something like that. And I just thank you for coming and sharing your passion about what we have going. And in particular, give the address again for your cruise operation. So if people are interested in, God, this sounds like such a fun thing. We I need to put that on our bucket list. Where do they go to get more info? Yeah, no, I mean, I'll give you a couple different spots. Uh, one is just our website. So Blue Ribbon Cruise, just like it's normally spelled, just all together. So blueribboncruise.com. Or you can always email me too. Um, easily reached. Uh, Chris, so just my first name, C-H-R-I-S, at blueribboncruise.com. And... Get the skinny, yes. Well, in this yeah. case, it might be the fat because we when you it. go on a cruise, sometimes you come back with a few extra pounds. That's 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 what all the uh, that's all what all the yoga and excursions are for, so we can balance it out. <laughs> Amen. Well, folks, thank you for following the Spill the Wine Show podcast. Yeah, we'll be uh, posting up as I'd mentioned. Mister Chapin has decided that he we're going to sit and sip some wine and talk about specifically the trip he had up the Dural River. And I'm really excited about that. That took place six months ago, but here we are with summer coming on. Things are slowing down a little bit, and I can drag him aside. You know, when you're 
the head honcho at a winery, you don't necessarily have big gaps of time to give up to other things. You've got to keep everything rolling. So uh, we're going to sit down and have a little fun with that. So I'm just remember, it's the Spill the Wine Show podcast. For the pictures, you go to spillthewine.show. Yeah, we've got uh, our own site there, and lots of times we have a lot of pictures. And Roland, my producer, will put some on Instagram and those kinds of things. I always shoot a, a few shots with every with every story to go along. And we'll be catching you on the next round on the Spill the Wine Show podcast. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.